Hi. The topic of this video is hemophilia basics. I'm James Harper and welcome to the video. The objectives of this video are to differentiate hemophilia A and B, to discuss some basic genetics of hemophilia, to differentiate between the severe, moderate, and mild terms used to describe hemophilia, to describe the bleeding pattern seen in hemophilia and differentiate that from a primary hemostatic disorder such as thrombocytopenia. We're also going to describe the basic concepts of treatment in hemophilia. Specific treatment problems will be discussed in later videos. So hemophilia is a term used to describe any deficiency of a circulating coagulation factor by convention other than von Willebrand factor. Um, the most common forms are hemophilia A, or classical hemophilia, which is factor VIII deficiency, and hemophilia B, or Christmas disease, which is a deficiency of clotting factor IX. Together, these account for about 95% of the congenital clotting factor deficiencies, with hemophilia A being vastly more common than, fa than factor IX, accounting for about 85% of all the clotting factors, deficiencies. Okay, so hemophilia is an uh, ancient disease. It was described you know, thousands of years ago. It's listed in the Talmud as the, uh, one of the exceptions for uh, circumcision. And until the 20th century, the hemophilic factor uh, deficiency can be a, a described as a short, painful life um, in which any surgical uh, illness or any injury could be fatal. Queen Victoria's son, for example, uh, died from slipping on a stair and falling two stairs. Um, life was painful. People would develop severe joint bleeds, which are both in the short term and long term intensely painful. Uh, as mentioned, any common surgical disease was impossible to fix. So appendicitis or tonsillitis or hernia just couldn't be dealt with. If you lived to be a teenager, and this was something rarely seen outside of the very rich, you were likely severely crippled by your joint bleeds, and these evolved into permanently deformed joints, uh, typically the weight-bearing joints of the lower extremity and then the elbows. Um, and really, only the very rich could afford treatment for their children, even in the late 19th century, and only then if the child was not severely affected. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, Alexei Romanov, the Tsarevich of, of the uh, Russians uh, during the imperial period, uh, had factor IX deficiency and uh, could be treated with blood transfusions, but then only... Um, uh, because he, he ultimately was found to have a mild uh, uh, factor IX deficiency. And even though things have improved, one of the things that's important is, is that most of the world's hemophilics still live this way. 70% of the world's hemophilics have little or no access to factor concentrates, um, and a prophylactic factor is, is a first world uh, phenomenon. So terminology, percent of clotting factor. This is the percent of clotting factor present in one ml of plasma, which is compared to normal plasma that's been standardized to 100%. So someone says they have a 5% clotting factor. That means they have 5% of the normal factor eight uh, present in a normal person's blood. Inhibitors are antibodies typically IgG, although others can arise, that bind clotting factor and prevent it from working. A target joint is a joint such as a weight-bearing joint in the lower extremities um, in which bleeding is repetitive. And by definition, this is either three bleeds in three months or six bleeds in six months or imaging evidence of damage. A bleed is a term used to describe a bleeding event, and that can be in any place. And then the annualized bleeding rate is the average number of bleeds over a period of time, 
uh, and then annualized for a year. And obviously the perfect score would be zero. The annualized bleeding rate is used to uh, uh, characterize the clinical bleeding uh, problems faced by our hemophilics. Okay, so hemophilia is described as severe, moderate, or mild. These have nothing to do with the clinical picture of severity, um, but have to do with the uh, depth of factor deficiency. And that can affect, in general themes, the clinical picture. Severe is less than 1% detectable clotting factor, moderate 2 to 5, and mild 5 to 30. A severe patient will bleed spontaneously. Um, that means they can bleed without evidence of trauma. Um, a moderate patient bleeds with mild trauma. Um, for example, slipping on a stair may well cause you to have uh, a severe bleed where a normal person it may barely cause a bruise. A mild patient will bleed excessively with trauma. Uh, for example, you could be hit in the head with a soccer ball and have severe concussion bleeding as opposed to a mild bruise in a normal person. A severe patient has a high risk of chronic joint damage because of bleeding in their joints. A moderate has less risk uh, and rarely develops target joints. And a mild patient has a low risk and essentially almost never develops a target joint unless they've had damage to the joint from other causes. Severe patients have a high risk of inhibitors Moderates less so, and milds low risk, but they do occur, particularly in adults, um, and so they have to be thought of in all of our patients. Okay, hemophilia A and hemophilia B. As we mentioned, A is much more common in B, and since about one in 5,000, uh, severe is the most common form of A, um, and there's large deletions, internal inversions, um, are the most common uh, genetic anomaly. Uh, point mutations are seen, but they're less common. And development of inhibitors is common. In B, the incidence is much less common, and mild and moderate forms are more common. Whereas in severe patients, about 80 to 85 percent are severe. In B, only about 45 percent are severe. And point mutations and small deletions are most common genetic errors. Development of inhibitors is rare, but this tends to be more serious as they are difficult to treat. Okay, distinguishing hemophilia bleeding from a primary hemostatic disorder. In a hemophilic, bleeding will stop initially, but then re-bleeding starts when the clot tears loose. Primary hemostatic disorders are slow to stop, but then once stopped, they stay so. For example, a child gets a small bruise or a bloody nose. Once you've stopped the bleeding in the bloody nose, it stays stopped. Whereas in hemophilic, you can cause the bloody nose to stop, and then when the clot retracts or breaks loose, the bleeding starts again. Okay. Bleeding in primary hemostatic disorders is on the skin and the mucosal surfaces, basically the parts of the body that are exposed to the outside world. And hemophilia, hemophilia is bleeding in the tissue or hollow spaces inside the body. And this is where broken blood vessels are unsupported or under mechanical stress. For example, you're stepping on your, your heel uh, and the blood vessels in your ankle and the blood vessels in your knee are under the weight of your body. Um, you move your arm and the muscles that you use to move your arm are squeezing and stretching the vessels that feed them. Hemophilic arthropathy. And this is an important complication hemophilia. It leads to the greatest amount of disability. Basically, this is what happens. Joints bleed into the injury from injury or from uh, microtrauma onto the synovial surface. Blood contains inflammatory cytokines, platelet-derived growth factor, and iron. The platelet-derived growth factor and the inflammatory cytokines stimulates the growth of synovial tissue. 
the synovial tissue um, uh, proliferates, but proliferates in a way that causes it to be fragile and much more prone to bleeding. So you start bleeding with less and less and less provocation. That cycling bleeding causes more and more inflammation, eventually causing scarring of the joint surface and an osteoarthritic spiral. So the spiral goes like this. The bleeding causes inflammation in iron deposits. The iron deposits kill off synovium and the part that it's inflamed uh, with the plate-derived growth factor causes proliferation. So part of it's growing hyper and part of it's dying off. This creates a roughened, fragile surface. And the roughened um, surfaces scratch on each other, causing more injury, more bleeding. The, the synovium on the outside bleeds and more. And that proliferation and bleeding causes more and more damage to the joint, eventually causing the joint to be destroyed utterly. And if you're interested in carpentry, you know what a block plane is. A block plane is a metal device with a sharp uh, knife in it that's used to uh, smooth a board. But the block plane's blade has to be straight, has to be perfectly aligned. If it's a little bit cockeyed at all, then when you move the plane across the board, you actually gouge the wood. And that's what happens here. These, these roughened surfaces gouge each other and stimulate more and more uh, bleeding until the uh, joint is completely destroyed. So some basic treatment concepts for hemophilia that you have to keep in mind whenever you deal with one of these patients. Clotting factors are very expensive. And the overall use of clotting factors has, can bankrupt small nations. And much of our uh, world supply of hemophilics don't have access to factor simply because their countries can't afford it. You have to use the correct clotting factor for the patient. If they have factor eight deficiency, you have to use factor eight product. You can't cross over. Um, the damage done from a given bleed depends on the nature of the injury the child received and the time between when the injury occurred and when they got factor. This is important because this tag, time lag actually kills people. It makes emergency room doctors write checks with lots of zeros. So we don't want to be that kind of person. We want to treat factor rapidly. All right. This is um, particularly important in ambulatory head trauma, and we'll talk about that in later videos. Factor may be given to prevent bleeding, and that's called prophylaxis. It's commonly used in children, increasingly used in adults. The result of prophylactic factor is we have children who um, have much, much healthier joints and dramatically lower uh, disability, um, and so are uh, reaching adulthood in good health. Um, so one of the things we also instruct our hemophilia families with, and we will instruct you now, is medical alert IDs. We talked about how the, the time between an injury and when they get factor is one of the variables that determines the outcome. And one of the ways we try to get people to make sure they know that they can communicate that they have hemophilia is the use of a medical alert ID badge. When you see a patient in an emergency setting, um, look for medical alert IDs and uh, use their advice. In the case of a new hemophilic, uh, in an ambulatory setting, um, not an emergency room, um, look for their medical alert ID anyways. And when you find it, compliment them for wearing it. Um, because this is really important in terms of, of identifying their problem when they're alone and they can't communicate. So the instructions I give to families, get a medical alert ID. Make sure if you have one that yours is still valid. Correct any out-of-date information regularly. And then if you need to replace one, remember there's boy-friendly and non-boy-friendly styles. Now, gentlemen, if you're with some ladies and you're going to watch this video, help them out here. But please assure them that when you are seven, bracelet A and bracelet B essentially had no significant difference between them. 
bracelets A and B and this kind of old school medical alert necklace tended to be eaten by the sock monster. They tend to get lost in the sock drawers and not be used. And while we strive to have our children tattoo free, adults will sometimes have tattoos like this. They will also use unusual things like watches or this little metal thing which uh, laces into your running shoes. Sports bands in one color or another are, are increasingly used. And the guys uh, that we take care of in the hemophilia clinic really like dog tags. So look for the dog tags. Um, but avoid the, the sock drawer. Okay, so we're going to do some review questions. Um, go ahead and pause the viewer if you, uh, if you need to think about your question. Okay, question one, 10-year-old boy undergoing a tonsillectomy. Surgeon is concerned. He's bleeding excessively. Which of the following sets of lab results with best supportive diagnosis of hemophilia A? And the answer is D. Factor option A is normal. Factor option B is both prolonged. And this would be an example of a, of a multi-factor deficiency such as uh, liver failure or disseminated vascular coagulation. C is prolongation of the prothrombin time, which would be consistent with factor 7 deficiency. D is um, the correct answer, and E, of course, is foreshortened. Question two. My Life, Our Future is a research study attempting to genotype all the hemophilics in the United States. A new baby is born to a family that has no family history of hemophilia. He has no detectable amount of factor nine. From this study, you'd be most likely to expect to find A, a large deletion of factor IX gene, a congenital mutation of von Willebrand factor presenting, preventing binding to factor IX, a point mutation that affects the enzymatic binding site of IX, a point mutation creating a premature stop codon, or E, an inversion between the promoter and the gene. And the answer is D. Large deletions occur in hemophilia B, but they're not most common. Von Willebrand factor, of course, binds factor VIII, not factor IX. And while a point mutation would destroy its effectiveness, factor IX would still be made and would still be detectable. Internal inversions are frequent in hemophilia A, in fact, are uh, a high-risk uh, mutation, but are not seen in hemophilia B. And direct uh, answer D is the correct answer. Okay, third question. Three-year-old boy needs an MRI for evaluation of a tumor. He has severe hemophilia A. He will require anesthesia to be sedated for the scan. Because of the tumor's location, anesthesia is unwilling to sedate him without intubation. Because of this, how would you alter his MRI preparation in light of his hemophilia? A. Give factor VIII concentrate to replace factor VIII to 100%. B. Give plasma to replace factor VIII to 100%, thinking that factor VIII concentrate is too expensive. C. Allow the anesthesiologist to intubate without any factor replacement. Or D. Refuse to clear the patient for the MRI. The answer would be A. A is a correct answer. Plasma would require a large volume and would cause circulatory overload and would also lead to a plasma exposure and would require uh, hepatitis monitoring. Um, intubation without factor carries a risk of bleeding inside the trachea and the larynx due to the endotracheal tube. Uh, these bleeds may be severe and life-threatening. Um, refusing MRI uh, 
may impair its diagnosis and the treatment of his tumor. Okay, this is the end of this video. If you have any questions, um, go ahead and email me at um, jlharper at uh, unmc.edu. Thanks. Bye.